Time is of the essence. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Daily Power Parish. Today is Friday, January 7th, 2022. Can you imagine? And we are going to jump into the sixth and seventh reading and uh, end this week on a high, on a Torah high with the energy of the Exodus because after so much buildup, the Exodus happens right now. Let's do this. 10th plague and the Exodus liberation. This is on tap for right now. So Parashas Bo, Torah reading is Bo. This is, um, I always think of the other bow. We have multiple bows here, right? Six reading, Exodus chapter 12, verse 29. Let's jump right in. It came to pass at midnight, and this is at midnight itself. Moses, as you recall, Rashi said, Moses said to Pharaoh around midnight, but it was actually at midnight, precisely at midnight. And the Lord smote every firstborn. As he promised in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who is in the dungeon. That's the Egyptian captive, obviously. And every firstborn animal that was already foretold by God to Moses that this is what's going to happen. And Moses shared it with Pharaoh, and Pharaoh didn't care, and now it's happening. Pharaoh's own firstborn son dies. The firstborn of the captives or the maidservants, whatever, they die Firstborn animals, they die. And Pharaoh, and until, and this is the way our sages understand it and tell us, until Pharaoh realizes that he's also a firstborn, that he himself is a firstborn. And Pharaoh rose at night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, everyone was up that night. And there was a great outcry in Egypt, for there was no house in which no one was dead. There was no house in which the death was spared. Every single household in Egypt had a death in that house. I believe it's our sages, maybe it's even in Rashi that says, if there was, yeah, if there was a firstborn, he was dead. If there was no firstborn in that family, how is that possible? Let's say the firstborn was away somewhere else and there was no firstborns in the house. Then the eldest household member was called the firstborn and they died and they died. So the point is that every household, whether a firstborn or the oldest member of the family, that's it. There was death everywhere. So Pharaoh, he called for Moses and Aaron at night. This is the middle of the night. This is, remember, the plague hits midnight. So this is what? 12.30, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., I don't know, sometime after midnight, that he calls for Moses and Aaron. And he said, Pharaoh says, get up and get out from among my people. This is not a game anymore. This is not a negotiation tactic. This is not a trick. This is not deception. This is panic. This is Pharaoh saying, get out, both you as well as the children of Israel, in other words, not just you, but everybody. And go worship the Lord as you have spoken. Go. I need you out. This is this is it. I mean, that, that was it. Two, out. Take your flocks and your cattle as you have spoken and go. But you shall also bless me. Bless me that I don't die this night. Help. Save me. Save my life. Remember, Pharaoh was all, oh, the adults can go, not the kids. Uh, the adults and kids can go, but not the animals. At this point, it's go, everyone out, 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 out. It's not, it's, we're not letting you out. We're kicking you out. That's, what, that's the energy of, of this evening, of the Exodus. So the Egyptians took hold of the people to hasten to send them out of the land. They, they actually were pushing them out. They're taking hold of the people to drive them out. For they said, we are all dead. In other words, if you don't leave, we're all goners. That's what they believed. They believed that every last one of them was going to die if the Jews weren't actually physically removed from the land. The people picked up, the Jewish people picked up their dough when it was not yet leavened. Their leftovers bound in their garments on their shoulders. That, that The indication here is, I mean, who's baking bread at 2 a.m.? Right. I mean, seriously, who's baking bread at 2 a.m.? It just means that, like, 
I mean, it also means dough and which will become matzah, second type of matzah as we've discussed, but it also connotes the fact that, you know, you ever see these um, uh, police photos of they're, they're investigating someone and they finally do a raid and they're gone. They were tipped off and you know, the people were, the suspects were tipped off and they, they flipped. But like you see, like a bowl of cereal on the table still. Like they left, they got word and they left immediately. And then when the police finally arrive, it's like you, the scene that's left is just like an open bottle of milk on the table. That's like what's going on here. They they picked up their dough when it was not yet leavened. Their leftovers bound their garments and their shoulders. They 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 ran. They they just they left with whatever they had mid you know, mid scene. They they took. Rabbi, you mentioned earlier in the week that there was significance of not to have leavened dough, even when they had the time before the yes. end. Yes. What was that again, please? Well, say? we don't know. I mean, the, the Torah, God, God had just told them, bake matzah. When you have the, the Paschal lamb, eat it with matzah and mar. Why God doesn't say? I mean, why even a Paschal lamb? Why mar? There's symbolism, certainly, but we don't. Look, the symbolism of, of symbolism of matzah is humility. It's, um, I'm going to use a word, but not in a negative way. So excuse my, you know, that it may have a negative connotation, immaturity, you know, immaturity in the sense, not, not, in, not in a judgment, but more of a kind of not immaturity. fully, not fully manifested, baked. not fully baked, right? Not fully, baked. not fully, I mean, not fully risen, not fully, you know, expanded, not fully. Yeah. This was a people that were beginning their journey. They were beginning their new journey. They were, they were, I mean, humble is one piece of it, but it's more than just humble. They were humble. Humble, you could always be humble. They were, um, I don't know, fresh. They were like, they were new. They were renewed. It was, it was a brand new, brand new thing. And, the, and that, so matzah symbolizes the flatness of matzah is like just someone beginning the journey. It's like the bread that has definition, texture, all that stuff to it. It's got, you know, it's already, already has a narrative. This is like the narrative is starting. Right. Ready to be embellished, it. ready exactly. to be, right. to flow in the future. Right. Ready to, to, to expand or whatever, but it's, it starts off like this. This is starting point. Um, yeah. And the 35 and the children of Israel did according to Moses order, as he had told them in advance of this exodus and they borrowed and borrowed, of course, is, uh, you know, not exactly borrowed, but they borrowed, they took from the Egyptians, silver object, golden objects and garments. They took out stuff, I guess, in the middle of the night, they still had the wherewithal to say, before we go, let me take some, uh, some stuff. The Lord gave the people favor in the eyes of the Egyptians and they lent them and they emptied out Egypt meaning they took all of the stuff they emptied out of Egypt. The children of Israel journeyed. Okay, so this is it. This is Exodus. It's happening. The children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot. Ramses was, I believe, in Egypt, and Sukkot was out of Egypt. That was the last city, the last stop in the border, and the first stop outside the border. You know, like when you're driving, and you see the sign like, welcome to Alabama or whatever it is, right? So it's like a moment ago, you were in Georgia. Now you're in Alabama. Oh, I'm speaking like a Southern. Anyway, they went from Ramses to Sugot. They went from Egypt to outside about 600,000 on foot, the men, besides the young children. And of course, besides the women. So 600,000 men between 20 and 60, because we'll, we'll have the census soon. We'll know that number precisely. Plus women, probably another 600,000. That's 1.2 million plus kids and elders above 80, above 60, sorry. You probably have uh, six, 1.2, 1.8, 2 million plus people that were traveling. And also a great mixed multitude went up with them. And flocks and cattle, very much livestock. What's the mixed multitude? These were Egyptians that said, we want to join. We want to join your team. These were Egyptians. That said, based on everything that we've seen, we want to go with you guys. We don't want to stay here. We don't want to be Egyptians. We don't want to be pagans and polytheists. We want to go with, with you guys. I will say that according to our tradition, this mixed multitude 
you know, there's, um, it's a mixed bag, if you will. Some were sincere, some just were, you know, catching the trend and weren't really into it. It says in the Medrash that God, sorry, Moses asked God, should we take him? And God says, up to you. And Moses says, all right, we'll take him. And on some level, it came back in some stories to haunt Moses because sometimes it was this mixed multitude that was causing some of, the, some of the challenges. It says, for example, the golden calf, a lot of it was driven by this mixed multitude. They were, they were I mean, not to, I feel like also maybe trying to shirk responsibility and say, oh, it was through the Egyptians that had infiltrated make it sound like a conspiracy, but it's, what, it's what's brought down in the books that there were some influences that had some Egyptian origin that were maybe steering it in part of the steering into a negative direction, not to, not to shirk responsibility, et cetera. But nonetheless, this was a very um, complicated piece of the story, the great mixed multitude that went up with them. Fine, let's continue. So they baked the dough that they had taken out of Egypt as unleavened cakes. I remember the dough that they had prepared, I guess, the night before to bake the next day, but they had a leave, so they just took the dough. Well, ultimately, they baked it unleavened cakes were not yet leavened, for they were driven out of Egypt, and they could not tarry. Right? There's no time to wait for the dough to rise. Sorry, God. Sorry, Pharaoh. Sorry, Egyptians. We have dough that we're preparing. And also, they had not made provisions for themselves. They needed to take out food. They hadn't packed um, sandwiches. And ever since, Jewish people, Jewish parents have always ensured that their children should always have enough. <laughs> say as the Hebrew word is seda. Seda means provision. Seda l'derech, food for the way. It's like, oh, you're going? Here's a sandwich. I'm going for 30 minutes. Don't worry. You never know what's going to happen. Take a sandwich, right? You got to have food. That's uh, that's the panic. So it happened then also. Sorry, they took bread because they had not made, prov they took the matzah because they did not make prov other provisions. And the habitation of the children of Israel that they dwelled in Egypt, oh, this is something we've spoken about before, right? What was the time span? 430 years. Not exactly. I've told you already that that's not exactly uh, the case. It's not 430. Okay. I know, it says, I know it literally says 430, but that's counting from like when God told Mo, uh, Abraham about the story. It doesn't mean this is the time that they dwelled in Egypt, but the time that was foretold that they were dwelling in Egypt. Okay, so it came to pass at the end of this 430 years, and it came to pass in that very day that all the legions of the Lord went out of the land of Egypt, the Jews, the army of the Israelites, so to speak. They weren't really an army, but they're called legions, like an army. They marched out of Egypt. It is a night of anticipation for the Lord. This is what we've been waiting for, to take them out of the land of Egypt. This night is the Lord's. God's night, guarding all the children of Israel throughout their generation. So here we have not only was it then a divine night, a miracle night, a God's night, but it's also for all time. It's our night. It's Pesach, Passover. It's, it's forever a celebration, a, a special night, a special occasion, a divine experience, and also known as Leo Shimurim, a light of guarding. A light in which we, a, a night, sorry, in which we feel that there's special, extra special divine protection that is afforded each of us, that is accorded or given to each of us on the night of Passover. It says, you know, you open up the door for Elio, for Elijah on, on the night of Pesach. It says that some people wouldn't lock their doors afterwards. I'm not giving, you know, advice. Listen, hey, I'm not uh, just saying it's considered to be a night of special protection. It's the night of the Exodus. It's a big deal. All right, let's continue. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, so the exodus has happened. The Jews are now free and they're, they're on the move. Meanwhile, God has a schmooze with Moses and Aaron. And he's, God says, this is the statute, statute meaning the rule, the law of the Passover sacrifice. No estranged one may partake of it. So it's for the Israelite, not for the stranger. And every man's slave purchased for his money, you shall circumcise him. Then he will be permitted to partake of it. So who's allowed to partake, partake of it? A member of the family. If you have someone who works for you, lives with you, part of the family, and also has a bris, circumcision, 
then they can eat of it. It's very, it's, it's almost sounds like very exclusive, but it is. There's some sort of um, exclusivity or very special um, uh, aura around this Paschal lamb. I mean, on a very practical level, it celebrates the, the, the Jewish liberation. It makes sense that it's a Jewish commemoration. A sojourner or hired hand, someone who's not an indentured servant, may not partake of it. It must be eaten, more laws. It must be eaten in one house. We said that we actually had that before. You're supposed to, if you, if you can't finish it, you have to you know, invite neighbors. But eat it in one house, no taking it. You shall not take any of the meat out of the house to the outside. No leftover, no doggy bags. No doggy bags for your uh, Seder experience. I mean, not for us nowadays, sure, no problem. But back in the day when they had a Paschal lamb, you couldn't, you're supposed to eat in the, in, the, in the house and that's it. Neither shall you break any of its bones. What does that mean? Even when you're eating it, don't break the bones. The commentaries say people break the bones to suck out the marrow. But you only do that when you're really hungry and you have no other food. So you get every ounce of food. But on Passover, we're supposed to have a Seder, like a king. You know, we recline, we lean on Passover. We're supposed to have enough food that we're not breaking the bones to suck out the marrow because we don't have enough to eat. You should have enough to eat. and We should have um, Bar Chava, which means an abundance on the night of the Seder. The entire community of Israel shall make it. Everyone, all Jews, should partake in a Seder. And should a proselyte reside with you, he shall make a sacrifice to the Lord. Someone who converts to Judaism, 100%, obviously. All his males should be circumcised. Then he may approach to eat it. So assuming that there's bris, I mean, it's clear that there's a, a stipulation. First bris, then, then you can eat the lamb. You want the meat? All right, you got you got to... You got, you got to first uh, have the circumcision. And he will be like the native of the land, but no, no uncircumcised male may partake of it of the Paschal lamb. This is not talking about the Seder, by the way. A Seder is what we, it's talking about specifically the carbon Pesach, the Paschal lamb offering. Just to clar a clarification. Back in the day at the, at the Seders of old, that was part of the Seder. But it just means that specific piece of it, the meat, the lamb, of the Paschal Lamb, these are these are the, the stipulations. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who resides in your midst. Everyone's got to have a bris. Everyone's got to, you know, et cetera. All the children of Israel did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so, so they Rabbi, did. Rabbi, yes. Rabbi, that's a little confusing because we've been reading that the non-Jews don't eat the Paschal Lamb. And now right. it's saying that everyone should do all the mitzvahs. I think what it means is... When there's one law, my understanding of it is one law means that there's an expectation. So if you're if you're me if you're in that if you're in that space, then great, you got it. If not, then we're not going to bend the rules and make an accommodation. You with me on this? Okay. One law meaning not that everyone's included, but that everyone has to abide by the same law. If you're not brisk, if you don't have a brisk, then that's it. Then 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 you can't eat of this of this meat. You can still have oh. the other okay. thing. One law means everyone's got the same criteria, if you will. Gotcha. That, that's how I understand it. Yeah. So it's actually supporting what we've been saying. And that's how I understand right. it. Right. Um, so, all, so everyone did as, as they commanded. Okay. It came to pass, and this kind of like sum, sums it up. It came to pass on that very day. <clears throat> that the Lord took the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt with their allegiance. Exodus. Exodus on that day. All right. Let's move on. Reading number seven. Um, reading number seven. I'm just going to check something very quickly. One sec. Um, Okay, now we get into the next reading, final reading of Bo. We're not going to have time for Aptora today, unfortunately. I know two in a row is not a good trend, but all right, we'll, we'll, we'll get this in. Torah reading for Bo, seventh reading. This is for tomorrow. Exodus chapter 13, verse number one. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, and this is directly connected with plague number 10, which is death of the firstborn Egyptians. So God says to Moses, sanctify to me every firstborn. The Jewish firstborn, the Israelite firstborn, they owe me one. 
right? Everyone that opens the womb among the children of Israel, among man and among animals, it is mine, right? I, the firstborn uh, humans and animals died, firstborn males, not the, not the women, but the firstborn men, males, and the animals all died in that plague the, of the Egyptians. You guys I spared. Remember, I passed over you guys. All right, you owe me one, right? Hey, you could have been amongst those. I mean, he doesn't say it so blatantly, but you, you, you owe me your life, so to speak. So you belong to me. So Moses, what that means essentially is that there's a spiritual connection, spiritual connection with Hashem, the firstborn. Moses said to the people, remember this day. Remember this day when you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for with a mighty hand, not literally, with a mighty hand, the Lord took you out of here, and therefore no leaven, oh, no leaven shall be eaten. This is now for future generations on Passover, right? So remember what Hashem did, etc. Therefore, when this commemoration comes back around on an annual basis, no chametz. The Hebrew is literally chametz. Chametz means leaven, bread, and anything else, plus anything else that's leavened. Don't eat on Passover. Today you were going out, the Chodesh Aviv, in the month of spring. It was the spring. And it will come to pass that the Lord, good weather to leave. Nice, nice weather. It's at least not raining. And it will come to pass, I mean, hopefully not. It will come to pass that the Lord will bring you into the land. Oh, here's the promise of, uh, of, of Israel. God will bring you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hevites, the Jebusites, which is for your forefathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. We've had that before. And you shall perform this service in this month. This service in this month means the Seder, the Passover observance in this month of springtime. Every year, commemorate this miracle as a holiday. For seven days, you shall eat unleavened cakes. That's matzah. And on the seventh day, there is a festival for the Lord. Unleavened cakes. We said before, the first and seventh days are holy days where no work is done. The middle days, you can do work. Etc. Unleavened cakes shall be eaten throughout or during the seven days. And no leaven shall be seen in yours and your possession. And no leavening shall be seen of yours throughout all your borders. No chametz. Don't only... It's not only don't eat the chametz, don't have the chametz, don't look at chametz in your house. I mean, if you walk by a bakery, it, it is what it is, but not in your house. If you have it, what we do today is you put it in a closet and you just put tape over it. And then you sell it. You officially sell the rights to someone who is in Jewish so that you don't officially own it. So you're not allowed to own it. You're not allowed to find it. You're not allowed to see it. Certainly not allowed to eat it. I mean, I mean, you could you know, close your eyes. No, but you also not eat it. It's uh, totally off limits. It's kryptonite on Passover. And, the, and you shall tell. Now, again, we get into legacy. How do we keep this going? It's not enough that you're inspired to this. You got to make sure that you pass this inspiration to the next generation. You shall tell your son on that day, which I would imagine means that day, meaning in the future, but also on Pesach on that other day, on, on, yeah, on that holiday, saying, because of this, the Lord did this for me when I went out of Egypt. Yeah. God, this is so, it's, he's not specifying, but such and such did God for us when we left out of Egypt. Because of this, that's why we're doing these commemorations, eating the matzah, getting rid of the chametz, cleaning the house. All, why all this stuff? Because of what God did for us when we went out of Egypt. And it shall be to you as a sign upon your hand and as a remembrance between your eyes. That's the tefillin. You shall wear tefillin to remind ourselves of the Exodus as well. In order that the law of the Lord shall be in your mouth, for with a mighty hand the Lord took you out of Egypt. Remember, every single day, not just once, once a year, uh, Pesach. Every day when you wrap tefillin, remember the Exodus. And you shall keep the statute at its appointed time from year to year. That means the holiday should be at its set time annually. And it will come to pass when the Lord will bring you into the land of the Canaanites, the promised land, as he swore to you and to your forefathers, and he has given it to you. It's going to happen. When you get there, that you shall give over to the Lord whatever opens the womb, and every miscarriage that opens the womb of an animal will be yours. The males belong to the Lord. So any birth, any birth that opens the womb, so to speak, of the animal, we're talking about animals right now, 
All of the animals should be given as a sacrifice to God. The first of the animals should be given. The firstborn male animals should belong to God. Because again, the, the firstborn death was only, only hit the Egyptian males and the Egyptian male animals, it seems. So the Jewish-owned male animals, the firstborn, as a sign of gratitude and acknowledgement of thanks, thanks for not taking out ours, we offer up to Hashem as a gift. Now that's obviously kosher animals. What happens if with their firstborn donkey? God says God doesn't want your firstborn donkey because can't offer that as a sacrifice. So the Torah says, right? And your and every firstborn donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Switch it out with a lamb. You take your firstborn donkey. Okay, got to give this to God, but I can't offer. You can't bring a donkey at, on the altar in the temple. So got to switch it with a lamb, and then you bring up the lamb as an offering. That's it. You just swap it out for a kosher animal. And if you do not redeem it. Uh oh, then you can't work it. It's not. It's not your animal. It's God's animal. The donkey is. If you don't redeem it, then you shall decapitate it. Oh, sounds kind of harsh. And every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. Firstborn humans as well, redeem. Don't give to God literally, but redeem and give. Uh, give money to the Kohen, etc. And it will come to pass if your son asks you in the future. Once again, we're we're anticipating the narrative. What the narrative should be. When your son asks you, if, when your son asks you in the future, what is this? What are you doing? What's the Seder? What's the Passover lamb? What's the matzah? What's the mar? You shall say to him, the mighty hand, did the Lord take us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage? Look what God did for us. It's amazing. And it came to pass, the narrative continues, when Pharaoh was too stubborn to let us out, the Lord slew every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I slaughter for sacrifice all males that open the womb and every firstborn of my sons. I will redeem. It sounds like this, this, this question is triggered by the laws of the firstborn, the firstborn uh, bringing an offering from the firstborn animals and redeeming the firstborn son. The question that the children might ask is, why are you doing this? Why the redemption of the firstborn? Why the offering to the, uh, of the firstborn? The answer is because God took out the Egyptian firstborn, but he spared ours. And once again, tefillin, it shall be for a sign upon your hand and for ornaments between your eyes, tefillin on the hand, the arm, tefillin on the head. For with a mighty hand did the Lord take us out of Egypt. And that's how the reading ends. What's the moral of the story? There's a few things that I want to mention. Number one, number one. Um, the first message here is that when it's time, it's time. Until then, you couldn't convince Pharaoh to let us go. At this point, Pharaoh, you can't convince him to let you stay, right? Just the, you know, when it's time to go, it's time to go. And that was it. They were out. They were out. Um, we have this idea of not breaking the bones, not breaking the bones of, of the of the Paschal Lamb. It's we're not we're not eking out every little piece. We're we're like king's royalty. Pesach is royalty, and really we're always meant to, to feel that nobility and royalty when you look at yourself like a king or a queen or a prince or a princess it's a different ball game than when you look at yourself like you know a schlump as they say in yiddish like uh whatever a schlepper yeah we don't want to be a schlepper we want to be a king a schlepper how do you translate schlepper who knows i don't know i can't translate it schlepper means like uh whatever just a whatever no you're not a whatever you're you're nobility that's that message there and the final message the final message well there's a message of gratitude God spared the firstborn, so dedicate the firstborn, dedicate to Hashem. And the final message is about the narrative and about knowing your audience. The Torah multiple times says, what's going to happen if a later generation is going to wonder why you're doing this, that, or the other? Here's what you should answer. And the Torah gives multiple answers, even though it's the same story. The, same, the answer should be the same. We were in a, Egypt, God took us out. But every time it's written a little bit, three times in this week's Torah portion. There's a fourth in Deuteronomy. This is where our sages derive the four sons or the four children at the Seder. The idea that there are different people, different personalities with different types of questions. You have to know your audience. One person has this question and that needs that answer. One person has that question and that answer. You have to match up the question. Sorry, let me try that again. You have to match up the answer, the response to the questioner. Don't give someone who has this question, that answer, even though for someone else that would work, but for them, it's not going to work. 
Answer, I, I, I don't think I'm being clear. Let me try to be a little bit more clear. Um, answers are contextual. Education is contextual. You got to know your audience. You got to know who you're speaking to. On Fridays, I teach kids. And sometimes I would love to share the same stuff that we talk about here, right? On the power show. I would love to share that with the kids. But I can't, you know, they can't, you can't necessarily speak, you know, one for one stuff that you and I get like this intuitively, because, you know, that this is, you know, these are issues that we're facing, whatever, when speaking with kids, you got to speak a bit of a different language. Okay, you got to, you got to know your audience. It's always true, especially when it comes to education. So the Torah says three times, this is partial. when you're going to be asked, what's, what's going on? What is this about? You got to know what to answer. You got to know who's asking the question. The answer is ultimately the same, but how you articulate the answer should be based on who's asking. Sometimes people need an intellectual answer. Sometimes people need an emotional answer. Sometimes people need a practical answer, right? You got to know. You got to have that sensitivity. You got to answer. So I'll, I'll finish with a story. There was a great rabbi who was once approached shortly before Passover by a man who asked the question, I have, a, I have a, a Jewish legal question, a halakha question. Are you allowed to use milk instead of wine at the Seder? Instead of four cups of wine, can I use four cups of milk? The rabbi said, you know, I don't know, but let me give you some money. Here, here's a gift. The man was grateful and left. There was somebody who was watching this who said, the rabbi, why did you say you don't know? The answer is obvious. You cannot use milk. You have to use wine. The rabbi says, of course I knew that. But I knew that he wasn't asking a halacha. He wasn't asking a theoretical question. He was asking because he didn't have money. He didn't want to know if you could use milk. What he was really saying is, I don't have money to buy. For the, and if, I, he does, if he doesn't have money to buy wine, he certainly doesn't have money to buy meat or fish or anything else. So the rabbi said his question was about milk, but his real request was for help with the holidays. So I answered his question, not by telling him the halacha of milk versus wine. That's not the point. I answered his question by giving him money. We have to know who's asking and what they're asking because we might be totally missing the point. You might think you know and give an answer and that's totally not what they, what's bothering them or what, what the issue is. It's a sensitivity. So the Torah reminds us, and this is my final idea for this week, always be sensitive. We have to know ourselves what we're asking. It's not always easy to know even within ourselves, but certainly when it comes to someone else, we got we to gotta get to know them. All right. Thank you for joining. It's great to see you, Sandrine and Dina. I love Just it. quick, 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 quick. I wanted to, I made a, a set in part in, in honor of the Exodus. Oh, so nice. yeah. So, okay. Nice. Love yeah. that. All the jewels. If, do you see the, but they, did, they were supposed to put the picture of the jewelry as the main picture. It's underneath. I see okay. it. it. It honors. Yeah, the set of the necklace, it has rubies, emeralds, sapphires, and the earrings have diamonds. It's my most luxury piece. And it honors all the way that jewelry and gems are honored, especially like when they took the jewels out of took Egypt. The yeah, I love it. I yep. love it. Beautiful. All right. It should be, it should be Bahat's All right. I, got, I actually have to run. I know I started late and I'm ending with a bang, but got to run. I'm, you hear the calls coming in. All right. We'll see you soon. Have a good Shabbos. Take care, everybody. Ciao, guys. Thank you. Take care. Great to see you guys. Yeah.